Well, good morning. I am Pastor Brian Sewell. I'm glad you are joining us once again here today. Um, we are continuing our study on the end times uh, titled Earth's Final Days. And um, we are looking at the Antichrist. We started this study last week. We're looking at part two here today. Last week, uh, we looked a little bit at the, the Antichrist. Um, uh, the Apostle John mentioned the Antichrist there in 1 John and the coming of the Antichrist. And then um, we see these words, children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So very clear in the Bible that the Antichrist is, is one who's going to come. If you remember last week and just um, uh, reviewing this here rather briefly, um, we looked at his personality. He is going to be a very eloquent and charismatic leader, very likable among the people at the beginning but also one who's cleverly deceitful and intensely cruel. Um, his true colors will come out soon and after his arising. Uh, we also looked at his portrayal, uh, ordinary common roots. He'll be uh, coming from ordinary common people, um, rising to power, uh, very blasphemous towards God and, and those who follow God. Also a very terrifying presence we learned last week, and but also the good news in the midst of the bad news is he will be very limited in his power. He can only do what God allows him to do in, in God's permissive will. Um, his program, um, he will come with signs and wonders and miracles, um, wooing the masses over him and, and gaining tremendous popularity in the end times. Um, he will be blasphemous in his actions and not only his speech, but his actions as well. He will rule over the earth. There'll be that control within the, uh, the earth of the, the Antichrist. And he will also desecrate the temple, the Jewish temple that's been re rebuilt in the last days. But today what I want to look at is we're going to look at some of the conditions surrounding the uh, rise of the Antichrist in the last days. We know that is uh, going to happen here soon, I believe, very soon. So the conditions surrounding the Antichrist, uh, three conditions namely, and we'll be looking at those. Uh, the first one is this. There will be widespread apostasy within the Church of Christ. and. And it is very uh, prevalent right now. I just want to bring this to your attention. It's, it's, it's um, so important to know. But before we get into that, I want to remind you of uh, this uh, passage there in First Thessalonians, our Second Thessalonians by the Apostle Paul. He, he speaks of this very clearly, this, um, this rebellion, this uh, turning away of the church from, from the gospel truth. The Apostle Paul says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called, called God or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. But, but notice that there's that mention of the rebellion, of the rebellion being the apostasy of the church. And I uh, just want to remind you of uh, just the, the gospel, um, very clear. The true gospel teaches that, that apart from God's mercy and saving work of, of Jesus on the cross, people are hopelessly lost. And, and just a, again, a reminder, you could say it like this. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the gospel. That's the, the true gospel. We need not add anything to that. But, but um, there are uh, very um, many passages that attest to this. My favorite, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 to 8. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated um, us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God. So the gospel is, is about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God. It's based upon faith and based upon the grace of God and what Jesus has done on the cross. And we dare not add anything to that, but here's where we get into the apostasy, this increase of widespread apostasy and, and the heresy that's going on today. One of the most prominent and disturbing distortions of the gospel, I believe, is the health, wealth, and prosperity teaching that is uh, so uh, prominent. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to mention this in love and Christian love. I just want to point this out, um, hoping that someday these teachers I'm about to mention will, will turn from their error, turn from their apostasy. But I'm also mentioning these uh, teachers because you need to be aware of this because this is very important. You need to practice discernment. Here are some of those teachers of what I believe, uh, false teachers, uh, uh, veering away from the true gospel that's presented in God's word. The first one being uh, Kenneth Copeland. You know, Kenneth Copeland's net worth, believe it or not, is upwards of $700 million. Uh, he has a fleet of jets. He has his own airstrip. He has a compound that he lives at in Fort Worth, Texas. And he is, if you will, the poster child for the Word of Faith movement and the prosperity gospel. So Kenneth Copeland is one of those uh, very um, prominent teachers that we have today. Todd White is coming on the heels of Kenneth Copeland. He's in, in essence uh, taking the baton from Kenneth Copeland and he is uh, becoming very big in the prosperity gospel as well. Well known for his alliance with uh, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, he is uh, uh, caught up in the prosperity gospel. Uh, Todd White is all about um, evangelism by blessing. And what he is doing is he uh, uh, is going on the streets, um, just cold turkey, going up to people, asking them whatever problems they might have, and then, then attempting to heal them and, and show them the love of God through that. But Todd White is all about this, this um, prosperity gospel. And, and so, again, he's uh, taking that baton from Kenneth Copeland. Here's another uh, famous uh, Bible teacher, um, Benny Hinn. A, f a faith healer, if you will. Uh, Benny Hinn is a, another predominant um, teacher of the prosperity gospel. Benny Hinn has a private plane. He has a 100,000 or 10,000 square foot home up north. He also has a, a mansion that overlooks uh, the ocean there in California. He has a, a couple jets, a G4, uh, G5. He eats at the finest uh, food um, and restaurants. He has stayed in hotels that have cost over $20,000 a night on some of his uh, crusades. Uh, one was in Dubai. This is his nephew uh, speaking to this, who was uh, once on the, the team, uh, ministry team with Benny Hinn, but has since uh, left that. Um, but one night they stayed, stayed in Dubai at a hotel called the Burj Al Arab. Um, it was a hotel that's shaped like a sail. They were uh, picked up by three white Bentleys. Every room uh, uh, in the suite uh, was a royal suite and, and they stayed there. There were gold everywhere, even in the showers. And so this is something uh, of what's going on in the lifestyle of Benny Hinn. I'm not gonna make any um, friends here, but Joel Olstein is also what I would consider a false teacher who's gone away from the gospel. Uh, he has a net worth of $50 million. Um, the pastor loves luxury. Uh, he has a lavish lifestyle. He owns a $10 million uh, mansion. He has a garage full of luxury cars. One of his favorites is the Ferrari. And he is a senior pastor of Lake Lakewood Church with more than 43,000 followers. Has written many books, um, very prominent. Probably one of the most uh, um, up and coming and probably the, even uh, uh, probably most influential even today is Bill Johnson, who is uh, into the Signs and Wonders movement. More than 11,000 people call uh, Bill Johnson's church, their home church there in Redding, California, Bethel Church. Um, Bethel Church is, also has a school there. They're teaching thousands of students each year and sending them out, uh, pro proclaiming this uh, message that Bill Johnson is um, uh, teaching all about the prosperity gospel and the word of faith movement. So there's just a few of some of those prominent teachers that are in our um, culture and very prominent here today. Um, some of the theological errors being taught, and again, we're looking at this whole issue of uh, this uh, widespread apostasy of the church, the prosperity gospel, which I've already mentioned, little God's theology, uh, the word of faith theology, Jesus's loss of deity, the kingdom now teaching the secret knowledge, uh, fire tunnels and grave sucking. We're gonna look at just a, a few of these. Um, and what I'm about to do is just share some direct quotes to you from uh, some being from books, some being from uh, speaking engagements that these teachers have had. When it comes to the prosperity gospel, 
Uh, these are actual quotes, uh, Joel Olstein saying these words, I am strong, I am healthy, I am blessed, I am favored, I am a victor, not a victim. I am going to live a long, productive, faith-filled life. Um, Joel Olstein really into the prosperity gospel. Um, Kenneth Copeland, Jesus did not say that you couldn't get, uh, get your treasures in heaven out. Let's receive the offering. He's speaking in the uh, actual service. Let's receive the offering this evening and give you a chance to raise your income. So behind that teaching, if, if you give to God, he is um, definitely going to bless you um, financially. And, and again, uh, part of this whole prosperity gospel. Uh, Benny Hinn, God will begin to prosper you for money always follows righteousness. Poverty is from the devil, and God wants all Christians prosperous. Again, this is all part of this prosperity teaching. Uh, Benny Hinn goes on to say, and we are not ashamed of prosperity. We will not apologize for prosperity because it is the promise of our Heavenly Father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The problem with prosperity gospel is it's not biblical. A prosperity gospel is a, a way far away from the biblical truth of the gospel. There's also what I mentioned, the Word of Faith movement. Um, one who is uh, as definitely predominant in that is Joyce Meyer. We serve a God who calls things that do not exist as if they clear or if they, they already existed. So that is how powerful your words are. Um, so a few other quotes here in the Word of Faith movement. Joel Olstein, your words have creative power. If you think bigger, you will live bigger. And then uh, these words, uh, also from Joel Steen, I am young, I am beautiful, I am attractive. Remember, what follows the I am is going to come looking for you. And then we have these words from Bill Johnson, Bethel Church. Now let's read it and let's make bold confession. This was a, a, a responsive reading they had in their church there at Bethel. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance. So again, the teaching behind this, if you just speak it, you name it and claim it, um, it will happen. This is so unbiblical. Um, we go on, this is uh, perhaps the, the biggest heresy of all. Uh, little gods, um, what is going on there in this movement and this whole this uh, movement that is growing uh, all across the United States is that there is this elevation of man uh, making him into a little God. Creflo Dollar, uh, one, one of the evangelists, says, you're God's little G, speaking to the people uh, there at the, uh, the conference. Kenneth Copeland says, you don't have God in you. You are one. And then Kenneth Copeland goes on to say these words. And Adam was as much like God as you can get. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. He wasn't a lot like God. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. So there's this deification going on of people um, to raise them up, to elevate them, um, to become like um, God. Kenneth Copeland says, you have exactly the same spiritual DNA as Jesus. You are a twin to the master himself. And then we see these words from Dot White. You got the very DNA of Abba, God the Father, coursing through your veins. Well, here's a, another teaching I'm going to just uh, touch upon here briefly. Another very um, heretical teaching, Jesus' loss of deity. There's this belief and there's this teaching that when Jesus came to earth, that he emptied himself of all deity. And then, in other words, he, he was no longer God when he lived upon this earth. He was fully man, but, but no God. Zero percent God, 100 percent man. Bill Johnson says these words, He, Jesus, performed miracles, wonders, and signs as a man in right relationship to God. And notice, he goes on to say, not as God. If he performed his miracles because he was God, then they would be unattainable for us. But if he did them as a man, I am responsible to pursue his lifestyle, which leads us into another uh, a teaching here, the Kingdom Now theology, basically uh, saying that people can experience all the signs and wonders and miracles uh, that, that Jesus uh, did. Anyone who thinks he can represent the Father without miracles does not understand the Father. To think that I could adequately display the love of God without power is absolute nonsense. 
It is an absolute insult to the gospel. And I would say this kingdom now theology is actually an insult to the true gospel. Now I mentioned uh, before fire tunnels. Um, this is happening at Bethel Church in Redding, California. Um, people are lining up, uh, some of the, the, the church members lining up in two lines and, and they send students down the middle of the line to get the anointing of God upon them so they can perform signs and, and healings and wonders and hoping to get that uh, anointing of God. There's also mention of, uh, uh, that this happened in the service at Bethel Church, the glory clouds where, where God supposedly, his kind of glory showed up in the middle of the service and, and gold dust began falling um, throughout the, the, the building. Uh, one of the most strange uh, doctrines and teachings uh, that's being connected with uh, Bethel Church there in Redding, California, Bill Johnson's church, is grave soaking, where people are going up to graves and they're trying to soak up the anointing of, of other Christians, uh, perhaps that have lived before them and have died. Uh, the picture to your left is actually uh, Bill Johnson's wife um, hugging a grave, grave soaking. Um, you see the other um, um, picture there, a girl laying by a grave and all her friends touching that grave. Again, trying to get the anointing of deceased ones and just really strange uh, teaching. So um, as we talk about the coming of the Antichrist, it's, it's important to know that one of those conditions is this widespread heresy that's taking place among the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, it's happening today. It is there. We're, this widespread teaching is all over the place. There'll be another condition that is talked about. Um, the Apostle Paul mentions it in 2 Thessalonians. There will be a terrible increase of evil. Um, there in 2 Thessalonians, we see these words, and now you know what is holding him back, speaking of the Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. So the Apostle Paul is talking about this coming day, um, these circumstances where, where evil is going to um, multiply and increase very quickly. And the secret power, notice he says the uh, secret power of lawlessness is already at work. And so as we come to the revealing of the Antichrist, as, as we come to that day, this increase of evil is only going to escalate. Uh, the root of growing evil. Um, in that passage that talked about the restraint of evil being removed, namely the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to be removed from this world. Christians will be removed from this world. There will be no testimony, no witness, and no restraint of evil. Um, Christ spoke of its coming. He says these words in Matthew chapter 24, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So there's going to be this coming um, rise and escalation of evil uh, just prior to the uh, Antichrist being revealed and rising to power. Uh, Paul also predicted this uh, coming, this rise of evil. But understand this, that in the last days there will come uh, times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. So there are the, these very clear indications that evil was, is going to be on the rise and then will escalate as we approach the time of the Antichrist. Um, I want to talk just, just very briefly about depravity. You know, depravity basically says that sin has affected every part of our being. It doesn't necessarily say that we're, we're, um, we've become the worst uh, person ever in the world, but it is saying this, that sin affects every part of our being. Um, Chick Swindoll said it like this, if depravity were blue, we'd be blue all over. Cut us anywhere and we'll bleed blue. Cut into our minds and we'll bleed blue thoughts. Cut into our vision and there'll be blue images full of greed and lust. Cut into our hearts and there'll be blue emotions of hatred, revenge, and blame. Cut into our wills and you'll find deep blue decisions and responses. So there's this depravity that, that the Bible talks about that's a part of every person. Um, I want to talk about the expression of moral decline in our nation, in the United States, uh, just briefly here. Um, 
and, and four expressions, namely the depravity of our minds. We'll start off there. Um, the depravity of our minds, we see this. Um, actually, in January 2000, uh, 2016, there was a study done. There was a, um, actually some stats that were released from the largest uh, pornography website. And on that just that one website, in just one year, there was a total of uh, 4,392,486,580 hours that were viewed on this pornography website. Um, it's just uh, crazy. Um, another stat I can throw out to you, that there is uh, $99 billion that is made uh, globally off the sex uh, trafficking. And this is just um, um, a, an example of the depravity of our minds. I know millions of children around the world are trafficked um, um, this sexual exploitation. Um, many children grow up with the constant exposure to pornography, believe it or not, which blinds them to these dangers. There was, interestingly enough, a Barna study found that um, most teenagers are so acclimated to our culture today that they believe not recycling is more immoral than watching pornography online. So the depravity of our minds, uh, we, just one expression of the moral decline um, we go on, the depravity uh, is also found in our marriages today. Um, 2015 Supreme, uh, Supreme Court ruling, uh, many of you are aware of this, and that ruling in the United States, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, marriage was redefined no longer between a man and woman, but between um, same-sex couples as well. Um, from the beginning, though, Jesus said uh, these words out of um, Mark in chapter 10, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. So what happened there in 2015 was this um, depravity that's showing up in the marriages in the United States. There's also depravity in our schools. Um, the rising tide of secularism um, and humanism uh, uh, came about with John Dewey, a shy bookish educator from Vermont um, years ago. Dewey's core principle was, was this, that absolute truth is non-existent. His uh, core principle truth is that final truth was an illusion. Um, absolute unchangeable, unchangeable uh, truth does not exist. About that time, uh, in 1925, there was um, sympathy that was galvanized uh, through the scope trials uh, for the teaching of evolution in schools. Then in 1963, the Supreme Court um, went on and, and basically, organ, uh, basically made it illegal to organize and lead Bible studies by school officials. And sadly, we are seeing a rise of instances across the country in which students in public universities are are becoming very anti-Christian. Let me just uh, read you a few of these. That's, that's very interesting. Audrey Jarvis, a student at Sonoma State University in California, was asked by a university administrator to remove her cross necklace during orientation because it could potentially offend others. In Florida, at Polk State College, a professor gave, up, gave a student zeros on several assignments because the student refused to agree with the oppressed, uh, professor's anti-Christian bias. Another student at Eastern Michigan University was expelled for expressing her faith in a counseling program. Likewise, a student at the University of Wisconsin was informed by a professor that religious contemplations and the Bible belong to a different realm and not academic sources. So, he goes on to tell her, your arg argumentation among Christian lines are inappropriate for this presentation. I will not allow you to present unless you change this. You will also fail your presentation, uh, presentation if you discuss religion in connection with it. Um, one more thing I want to mention, uh, California State Universities have effectively evicted Christian organizations from university campuses by refusing to recognize Christian organizations and college directories and university websites. And also went on to mention they're increasing their room rental fees, forbidding them from representing themselves of campus wide open houses and tell the Christian organizations to accept California State Universities all comers policy. So very clearly there's depravity going on in the schools. There's depravity going on in medicine. Uh, Dr. Paul Church, um, uh, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. Uh, he was one of Boston's most loved 
physicians, a urologist who invested 28 years of practicing medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and teaching at Harvard University. A few years ago, hospital officials noticed that Dr. Church had posted his concern over the dangers of same-gender sexual activity. Hospital administrators uh, later expelled him from the school and the hospital. Uh, perhaps the most glaring example of depravity in medicine is what is called the abortion industry. That's the number of abortions that have taken place from 1973 when Roe versus Wade uh, came into effect till January of two, uh, two th or January 2020 here this year. 61,628, actually, yes, 61 million, I should say, 621,584 abortions have taken place. If you do the math and you would, uh, uh, just for simple math, say every baby's 20 inches long, and you take those babies and, and line them up uh, from head to toe, you could stretch that many babies across the earth five times. That's how many babies have been aborted since 1973. So there's depravity that's going on in the medicine field. Um, why all this depravity? Uh, the bottom line is this, the abandonment of God. I want you to see this, Romans um, chapter one, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal uh, power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God um, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Um, the root of all the, the uh, moral decline in culture is this abandonment of God. And then we go on uh, and read this uh, in Romans, the latter part of Romans. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, uh, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. The Apostle Paul, very clear, taking them um, this uh, root of the problem, this moral decline that's going on uh, even in our country today and talks about this abandonment of God. Well, one more condition I wanna bring to mind here, which I believe is a, one of those conditions that's gonna take place um, with the rise of the Antichrist, the revealing of the Antichrist as we approach that time, this will uh, continue to escalate. There'll be a strengthening of control over the masses there in the book of Revelation, we see these words, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb that spoke like a dragon. Now notice, it exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and makes, um, and in other words, the man's um, controls, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And then we go on in that chapter also it causes uh, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So we see that this, um, this control over the masses is going to continue to increase as we approach the time of the Antichrist. Uh, very clear uh, that, that, that this control is going to, take place. There will be the collapse of the world economy. Um, I think that it will uh, lay the groundwork for this control and continued control. Uh, the Apostle John says these words in Revelation 6, um, I have heard a voice from among the four living beings saying a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay and don't waste the olive oil and the wine. Very clearly speaking of the time of the tribulation there in Revelation chapter 6, but speaking of that, that collapse of the world economy, um, and this is uh, interesting, I just went on the website today, maybe you've uh, gone on this web website before, but it's the, the debt clock uh, going on right here in the United States. Um, 24 trillion, 944 million, 544, uh, 548 thousand and growing quickly. 
is where our debt is right here in the United States. It is not going to last forever. The, the economy with that much debt sooner or later is going to collapse and it's going to collapse all over this world, not just the United States, but very clear that there, there's going to be this coming collapse of the world economy um, that uh, actually aids this increase of control. The Antichrist will launch the mark of the beast. Uh, there'll be this uh, controlling um, mark. It causes both small and uh, great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. So again, this controlling issue behind the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of man and his number is 666. Now, I just want to touch upon this briefly. Um, with this mark of the beast, that probably represents the ultimate in, in human enterprise and, and competence. This mark of the beast is, is, uh, is basically 666, six, six, uh, six being the number of man, we are told in Revelation chapter 13 that we just read. Man was also, inter interestingly enough, created on the sixth day, and the number 666 six, six is man tripled. And again, probably represents the ultimate in human enterprise and competence. Um, the word uh, used for mark, by the way, in this passage that I just read to you, Revelation chapter 3, used in antiquity with the Roman emperor. And it often contained the emperor's name, his effigy, and the year of his reign. And it was necessary for buying and selling, and it was required to be affixed to documents to attest the viability. And the Antichrist is going to be doing the same with this mark. And again, there's this issue of control. And by the way, um, I guess I don't have to tell you, but I just pointed it out. We so quickly realized how um, this issue of con uh, control can grow overnight um, with this whole thing of the coronavirus. Um, and how quickly we can be told um, we can't do certain things and, and we have to limit uh, things. And uh, I realized that a lot of this is to, to help uh, curb the spread of the virus, but how quickly, uh, and just an example of how quickly the loss of control uh, that we have as, uh, as a people, as the masses here in the United States, how quickly it was er er erased. And so we have this, this increase of control that's coming with the um, Antichrist. The Antichrist will launch the mark of the beast, as I said earlier, the beast will have the technology, uh, technology the RFID chip. Uh, there's that chip, it's uh, no bigger than a grain of rice. Um, and as technology grows, I'm sure uh, so will that uh, um, example of uh, the technology and the mark of the beast. Uh, we also see that without the mark, there'll be no buying or selling. Again, that control issue. The Antichrist will launch the mark of the beast uh, the, with this warning. Um, those who receive the mark will be judged severely. I want you to see this very uh, clearly in God's word. Revelation chapter 16, the first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the earth, this bowl of wrath, and the harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. But it gets even worse. Another angel, a third followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night, those worshippers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So very clearly, uh, we are told in God's word that this mark of the beast is, will um, bring about God's uh, wrath and punishment. I want to close here this morning with this uh, Lessons for the Heart. And in fact, it's the same lessons that we looked at last week. Be discerning. We need to understand these things. Part of the reason why I, I shared with you these conditions of, of the coming of the Antichrist is so that you would be discerning, that you would know um, that we're uh, getting close in some of these areas. Um, again, this heresy that's becoming more rampant in the church. And, and we see that very clearly in God's word. We, we see the, the heresy, we see the rise of evil, we see uh, this increase of control over the masses. Those are three very clear conditions, I believe, that, that surround the coming of the Antichrist. And again, I want to say that uh, as we approach that, these conditions are going to grow in intensity. And, um, 
it's very, very um, uh, clear that we as believers in Christ need to be discerning and know the times. Again, the Apostle Paul says, Now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind and alarmed that the day of the Lord will come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness revealed the son of destruction. Then we have this lesson that we looked at last week, and again, I bring it to you today. Stand firm. And again, um, I remind you that these conditions are going to grow. I mean, we are already experiencing now, right now, in our country, in, a, in our culture. And we need to stand firm as Christians. We need to be strong, stand firm, um, and, and stand for truth. And we need to be very uh, clear on that. We ought always to give thanks, the Apostle Paul says, to God for um, brothers beloved by the Lord, just as he did, because God chose you as first fruit to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that then, brothers, stand firm. There it is. We need to stand firm. We need to be standing firm in our day and age. And then this one, um, and we'll close with this, be comforted. And again, I want to stress that we can be comforted because we have that hope of Jesus Christ as believers in Christ. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God of Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through his grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So we need to be comforted. Again, uh, Jesus wins and we win in the end. And, and as believers in Christ, that uh, we can grab a hold of that hope during uh, times like these. And and so I hope you were encouraged today. I hope that that your eyes were open somewhat to these uh, conditions that are going to be surrounding the coming of the Antichrist. Um, next week, we'll take a break because of being Mother's Day. And actually, I'm excited about next week because we are going to be able to meet again as a church right here in our sanctuary. And we'll be doing that, uh, seeking to practice um, um, just a, a common sense and and also uh, be practicing social distancing in, in the midst of that. But I'm excited about uh, seeing you again and worshiping together as a, a body of Christ here at Whippoorwill. Let's close in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for this time together here this morning. Thank you for uh, these truths that you've uh, laid upon our hearts uh, through your word. And Father, just encourage your hearts as we, as we think about um, these conditions. Um, Father, we pray that you give us um, minds of discernment, hearts of discernment. God, we pray that you help us to understand that, that there's this uh, apostasy that's coming upon the church and will increase as the, the time of the Antichrist uh, gets uh, here. And Father, we also see this uh, increase of evil as the time of the Antichrist approaches. And, and Father, we, we also see this increase of control over the people and over the masses as, as that time approaches. God, to help us to be um, all about worshiping you and loving you. Jesus, thank you for all that you did upon the cross. Thank you for your love for us. I, I just thank you for those believers that are watching today. Encourage your faith. Help us to grab hold of the hope of Jesus Christ, we pray. God, I pray for those today that have never trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. God, would you work upon their hearts Help them to see that now is the time to trust Christ. Now is the, tr the time to, to trust Christ and get this matter of salvation settled. Uh, Father, I just pray that you work in that heart for those that are, are considering that. And God, I just pray that you help them to come to trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone, by faith alone, for salvation. God, we ask your blessing upon us here today and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.